Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are connecting us from. Welcome and thank you for, uh, for those joining us live and those who will be listening this uh, recording afterwards. Please let us know which country you are from. And if you are a finance student, let us know which year are you studying by typing into the chat box. I would also like to warmly welcome our speakers today, whom I will shortly introduce. My name is Nilhan Uzman. I'm a pharmacist trained in Turkey. I've been working at FIP as the lead for education policy and implementation. I'm also the liaison to FIP's Young Pharmacist Group, YPG, and the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation, IPSF. FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and health technologies. And our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, science, and education. We are pleased to be delivering the 13th episode of the Responding to the Pandemic Together series today with you. Uh, due, to, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, pharmacy education has been disrupted and many universities are closed and the ways of learning and teaching have been shifted to online, remote delivery or no education at all. Today, we will have an introductive, interactive discussion with our speakers on the impact of COVID-19 on pharmacy education and we'll collect their perspectives on students and academics. You will take on strategies to tackle some of the key challenges on pharmacy education due to the pandemic. I have some logistics to share uh, before we start our discussion. Please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A box that you find underneath and let us know which speaker should answer your questions or is it direct questions to all of the speakers. You may also uh, send your questions directly to the speakers and then they can type the answers directly to you. This will also save time and we'll make sure that your questions are answered or we will be picking up uh, those questions throughout the discussion at today's session. Our session is currently live streamed on Faith FIP's Facebook profile and it is recorded and the recording will be publicly made available on www.fip.org slash coronavirus. This is our information hub that includes all of our COVID-19 resources. This is also an opportunity for me to invite you to join our Facebook group, COVID-19 and Pharmacy, where you can join a global network of pharmacy to discuss, share your experience in solidarity with pharmacists around the world. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers who have joined us from around the world. So I'll start with Professor Claire Anderson. Professor Claire Anderson is a, social is a professor at social pharmacy in University of Nottingham. Her major research interests are the role of pharmacists in improving health of the public and in pharmacy education. She is the chair of the English Pharmacy Board of Royal Pharmaceutical Society, and she is FIP's officer on focusing on academic capacity. Welcome, Claire. Thanks for Hello, joining us. Everybody. It's so lovely to see people coming in from all around the world. It's very exciting. Thanks. Thanks, join Thanks for joining us, Claire. And today we have Khalid Garba Mohammed with us. He's a registered and licensed pharmacist in Nigeria. He practiced as a hospital and community pharmacist before switching to academia. He worked as a resource person for some NGOs, and currently he's a third year PhD student in University of Milan, based in Italy, specialized in the field of oral dispersible dosage form intended for patient-focused therapy. Welcome, Galit. Hello, thanks, to, you. thanks for joining us. Thank Welcome. You. We also have Joe Getsch. <laughs> I, think, I guess I pronounced well. He is a fourth year pharmaceutical sciences student at the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Porto. He is the chairperson of the European Regional Office of the IPSF, International Pharmaceutical Students Federation, representing more than 500,000 pharmacy and pharmaceutical students and recent graduates worldwide. He is also a member of the monitoring committee of the course in pharmaceutical sciences of the University of Porto. Welcome, Joao. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nilham, for having us here. Thank you. And we have Dr. Sarira Elden with us. She's a pharmacist, lecturer, and mental health first aid instructor working at Sydney Pharmacy School. Her research focuses on mental health education and service delivery. She has received multiple awards for conferences, including one at FIP for her teaching at University of Sydney. Sarira is the national education representative of the Australian 
Australasian Pharmaceutical Science Association, and she's a fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. Welcome, Sarira. Thank you, Nilhan, and thank you, everyone, for coming in tonight and joining us. Thanks. So that's enough from me. I've told enough. I'm going to start our discussion, and I'll be asking some questions today to all of you. Uh, there are some generic discussions for us to open the discussion, to have an overview of the impact of pharmacy education. So I'll be starting with Sarira. Sarira, as a lecturer, uh, from your perspective, what have been the major changes and challenges in pharmacy education during COVID-19? Yeah, okay. Thank you, um, Nilhan, for that question. Um, so here in Australia, um, in addition to many challenges, which I'll discuss in a sec, we, when, when, when it kind of broke out and we went on lockdown, we were actually at the beginning of our academic year. So I'm sure many people can appreciate how much planning goes in before starting. And within a few weeks, we had to ditch a lot of those plans and, 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 and plan from fresh for, due to the COVID-19 um, lockdowns and measures that it were faced. Um, I guess some of the challenges were around um, everything that we usually do face-to-face. -face. Our programs uh, at the University of Sydney and, and most programs in Australia occur face-to-face um, -face and there really aren't many um, online options. So for us academics, we had to learn very fast uh, how to use Zoom. And for many of us, we had done a few meetings with colleagues internationally and all of a sudden we had 200 students per uh, year, our, our pharmacy degrees are four years that we had to cater to not just in lectures, but then in also hands-on tutorials and workshops. And uh, for many things, uh, we, you know, we, we worked over time and, and we tried to make it as smooth as a transition as possible. But there's some things that you just can't deliver online, like teaching uh, students how to compound medicines in a lab, for example. So there were some things that I guess you have no choice as an academic, but to delay a little bit. Um, but at the same time, acknowledging that you have students who are in their fourth and final year who also need to register in a, in a few months and, and, and start practicing as a pharmacist. Um, other um, challenges, of course, now as we're nearing the end of our first semester, were around um, examinations and assessments. Our exams are closed book and usually occur in big grand theaters in a grand hall around the university, and these also... Um, had to be changed and we had to learn about new softwares for assessment, for proctoring, for developing um, questions. Um, I don't want to go on too much, but I, I guess in a, in a nutshell, that those are some of our, the challenges that we've been uh, facing these past few months. Thank you, Sarira. Thanks for these experiences. We have been having several sessions and webinars on pharmacy education so far. So this has been the challenges that uh, many of educators, students have been facing. And these webinars is a part time for us to connect and find solutions all together and support us together. So thank you. You're yes, muted. I was on mute. Yeah. On mute. <laughs> yeah. So I'll continue with, I'll continue with Joel. Uh, I'll be asking the same question to you as a student, uh, and I guess you're in your last year? No, second or last. Yeah. Second last, fourth year. So mm -hmm. you're also coming towards the end, connecting from what Sarira has shared. What has been your experience? What kind of changes you faced? What has been the challenges you have been facing uh, due to COVID-19? Yeah. Thank you, Nilhan. Um, yeah, so when we saw that the, the outbreak appearing and the faculties starting to close, we saw that our professors really uh, very uh, responded very rapidly and reactive to implementing online education. So our theoretical classes rapidly moved online and our uh, research and practical classes were almost stopped. Um, it was quite important um, because the professors tried to give either live classes, live streamings, or uh, recordings and both have some advantages and disadvantages for it. For example, for live streams, we uh, the students can interact more easily with uh, the professors and ask questions and ask uh, the professor to repeat if needed. But uh, we have also to be uh, in consideration that with the, the outbreak, a lot of the schedule and the working schedule, studying schedule of the students and the professors changed and they have other commitments, either uh, caring for the family or having other 
personal uh, obligations that they didn't have before. So doing classes on live by live stream will probably increase the inequalities because some students will not have access to be available at, at any time. The, the schedules are really uh, unstable. Uh, so it's also important to, for the students to provide, uh, for the professors to provide recordings so the students can uh, see whenever they can. Um, the first challenge that we saw in the professors was, was really for the professors to be embracing the new technology, technological wave. And uh, we saw that professors that were reluctant to embrace technology, technological tools for the past years, they really um, were eager to uh, understand the new tools. And I can say, tell you for the personal perspective, I really think that my, my faculty um, made more progress in digitalizing education since the beginning of the year than in the past 20 years, which I think it's quite uh, good. Uh, but the, also we see challenges for the students because uh, if we uh, base our edu pharmacy education only in technological tools, we need to be uh, sure that the students can actually have access to, to those. One thing that in my faculty uh, they did, and I think it's, it was quite uh, important, was a survey by professors and students to understand um, the capability of the students to um, use these technological tools. Uh, I, I have a data from a study that we did from pharmacy students from the UK, France, and Switzerland, and 5% of them said that they, they feel completely left behind by the faculty. And it's not really optimal to have uh, technological solutions that are perfect for 95% of the students, uh, if we have 5% of the students that are, are not are completely left behind. And we have these multiples for public health uh, and in pharmacy education is the same. We have to make sure that tools are, are, are useful for everyone. Um, so my suggestion really is for the professors to test, try, uh, ask for feedback, constantly assess the, the results and then adapt and improve because this is also a new field for the professors and usually uh, what I saw as personal perspective was that the number of tasks really increased as a normal year. Professors were giving us a lot of projects to do and different tasks and do it, doing it online really uh, decreases efficiency and some tasks that probably in projects that in the past took two hours uh, uh, to our class to do uh, now we could uh, with working online with the group could take one day. Uh, so this is really something that we uh, we need to be uh, careful not to overburden our students and to and to try to, to try to protect their mental health and avoid uh, burnout and depression. Um, for us, it's for me, it's not really clear uh, what will be the impacts of COVID on the long term for uh, pharmacy education and also protecting the mental health of us, our students. But I really think that we have here some opportunities to uh, to try out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joao. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing all the experiences you share. I think inequity in education in many areas, uh, this is an important topic for FIP to tackle as well, because here uh, we are mostly from uh, Europe and Australia. So even in developed countries, there are inequities. And imagine the other regions of the world. So we have to be focusing on the equity in education. And also you mentioned that I mean, this is a, a forced change period. So we all have to change. We are digitally transforming all of us and we can't resist the change now because it's pushing us forward. And uh, I'll be also asking all of your questions about what would you like to continue what should, after the, the pandemic period? So we'll come to that in a while. Now I'll uh, continue with Claire and I'll be asking the same question. As a professor of social pharmacy, what has been some changes and challenges you have been facing? Uh, during the pandemic. I guess you're on mute, Claire. Okay. No, no, perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think one of the biggest changes is being at home and not seeing people face to face, seeing people in this manner, which is a massive change. I'm, I was used to doing this with colleagues around the world, but suddenly we're all at home, we're not together, we're not having lunch together, we're not seeing our PhD students, our research projects are suddenly not able to run because they involved patients in hospitals and the hospitals were too busy because of COVID. So, so many, many issues like that were going on. Um, so, um, and I think one of my, my issues was making sure that everybody in my team was okay and checking up on them because some people live alone. They were suddenly at home, isolated, quarantining on their own. So I think that was a problem as well. Um, and of course, um, our students 
Um, in Nottingham, we're quite unusual in that more than 50% of our students are not from the UK. So we went into lockdown three weeks, um, with three weeks left of our semester, and suddenly our students were dashing off home all over the world. They had to face quarantine, some of them in army camps, things like that. So they weren't, they weren't at home with their parents, they had limited access to internet. So suddenly we had a, myriads of problems, but my colleagues responded very, very well. And um, we decided to do um, asynchronous teaching quite a lot of the time. We did do some face-to-face. -face. Um, we did some individual tutorials and things like that. But we had to respond to individuals. We had to do our tutorials at different times because we had students in China. We had students in Canada. So very, very different time spans. So we had to adapt incredibly quickly. I'll probably stop there for now because I'll be repeating what some of the others have said. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Claire. I guess the human connection has been the most challenging one. Somehow things are moving, but when you stop for a while, you realize that something is missing. So it's great to hear these kind of experiences from you. I'm going to come into more detail about how you support your students and the academic staff especially in these difficult times, considering all these facts. So I'll be coming that to you, but uh, before I'll be moving to Khalid, and as a PhD student based in Italy, who has seen, faced the challenges before in many of the countries, what has been your experience? What, what challenges and changes you faced and uh, what, what, what experience you would like to share uh, with pharmacists around the world with us? Well, thank you, Nilhan. Uh, actually, the most important for me is the initial mental fatigue that I have experienced, especially during the first wave of the pandemic, particularly here in Italy. I could remember actually spending some nights at the beginning of the rise of the cases. Whenever I'm going to bed sometime, I, 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 I cry alone. Actually, I mean, you can imagine being far away from your family sometimes and uh, the situation rise and thinking whether you are going to meet again or not. So that is really a bit traumatizing, but thank God the situation improved. And then uh, secondly, the disruption of the lab activity, because my PhD is, I could say 98% or more lab-based research activity because we are dealing with pharmaceutical product development. So the disruption for over like three months is a kind of a challenging actually that was shut down of the university, you know, access to the laboratory. And in particular, I could remember at the beginning of the situation, we are running a kind of a, a non-stop stability, uh, stability study of a pharmaceutical product. So no assets, you can imagine uh, actually the disruption. And then the third is the issue of uh, maybe conferences. I remember I registered for many conferences, so there was cancellation. I remember the one I was supposed to attend in Austria around March. I paid for the conference registration. I booked my accommodation, booked my flight, everything, but canceled. So you can imagine all those kind of disruptions. And also, the, even though the FIP conference is recently canceled, but also it's also another disruption because I remember uh, this year I was privileged to be invited as one of the speakers for the FIP con uh, Congress, but also it has been canceled. So you can imagine all this kind of uh, disruption. So for me, these are the key challenges that I face during the wave of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Khalid. Thanks also for sharing a very personal experience with us. I guess this is important that we also communicate and connect through these experiences. Exactly. Uh, I guess the, this global family of pharmacists, we call it family, are sub here to support each other. So thanks a lot for sharing this. And I understand that it has been quite challenging for you to also disseminate your work, get feedback on your work, even through the conferences. Exactly. We, we understand that and we know that uh, our colleagues have been expecting uh, the FIP Congress, looking forward to it, us as well. But unfortunately, we had to postpone it. But through these online events, even though it's a virtual connection, we will make sure that we'll connect 
our pharmacist colleagues around the world share their work, learn from each other, and continue developing and supporting each other. So you can rely on that. But we understand the, the disappointment because it's a time where we all meet each other. So thanks to all of you. Also, thanks for sharing your questions to our participants. Some of them will be answered in a while. And continue typing your questions and we'll be taking these. I'm going to ask my second question to all of you. I'll make the same round again. And this question is also received from our audience as well. You mentioned a couple of interventions, new implementations in pharmacy education you faced. Hopefully there will be a post-pandemic period. We, have, we, have, we are learning a lot every day. We are trying and testing. So what are some innovative solutions or some hacks that you implemented in your school or you as a student you demanded from the schools to support you which of these should be uh, continued after the pandemic i started with i will start with sarire again so let us know your thoughts which should be a opportunity to advance pharmacy education further from our learnings yeah, thank you, um, Nilhan. Um, one thing that we've um, done in our uh, school over the last few years is to support our students is um, we've um, implemented mental health first aid training in our curriculum. And um, maybe not everyone you know, is familiar with the program, but I think all of us know what physical first aid is. As pharmacists, it's something I think in almost all countries we're required uh, to learn physical first aid when we be, when we become pharmacists. So mental health first aid um, is similar in that it's how to appropriately re respond when a person is experiencing a mental health problem or crisis. And that's something that we've, we implemented in our curriculum a few years back. But some of the things as a mental health first aid instructor that I've noticed during this COVID period is that we've had a lot of interest from um, other schools and other departments um, to, to go out there and uh, to their schools and train staff as well as students and to try and bring the training as early in the degree as possible. So, um, you know, different schools will do it differently, but uh, for, for us, we, for a while, we've done it in the last year of the degree um, to not just support the students, to support each other and their family members and friends, but also as they go out into the workforce, learning these skills to support their patients. Uh, we have a lot of um, research now that shows us that pharmacists um, come into contact with people experiencing mental health problems on an almost daily basis. Um, and some of them are experiencing crisis now in situations like COVID. And in Australia, COVID came right after bushfires. So we had already gone through something quite traumatic. And um, so COVID came straight after that. And, and, and I think it just tells us uh, more and more that we need to have some level of standard minimum mental health education, you know, across the world for pharmacists, similar to physical first aid, where we say we we all have it, we all know how to provide CPR and help someone in an emergency, we know how to call ambulance, all of that. I think we need to uh, work together and build the evidence for having um, something similar, a minimum standard of mental health education for all uh, pharmacy students and. Um, as well as, you know, at least in our school, we offer this to our staff as well. Um, but I think we can all do more in that, in that space. Um, I don't know if I've taken up too much time, so I might leave it there and maybe come back to it if someone wants to ask questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sarira. I think it's a, it's a great learning and this is a quite challenging situation, but mental health is a part of our everyday, everyday life, even through all of these changes and our daily life. So that's a quite interesting insight and I'll be coming back to you about deep, deep diving into some practical ways of uh, supporting students and maybe academics through the mental health education. Thanks a lot for your answer about this. I'll be moving to Joa with uh, the same question. So what has, what should, to be, what well, should be continued after the post-pandemic period, the innovation solutions you have uh, faced or what are some opportunities to be tackled more uh, to be extended to pharmacy education? What are your thoughts, Joao? Okay, thank you, Nihan. Uh, I would say the first easy answer would be 
um, the technological solutions that the professors now have the skills and are able to use and uh, the opportunities that these bring to uh, improving uh, learning and pharmacy education in general. I would also say that I felt that a lot of our uh, projects were more and they were giving, the teachers were giving more importance to problem-based learning um, and really uh, trying, to, trying to gain, I, I really felt that this semester I, I really learned more about gaining skills, collaborative work with the different students and also uh, improving my soft skills and I really think that uh, this is also an opportunity. Um, because the professors now had to uh, assess the students more on the base of them being able to uh, generate ideas and projects and not, uh, not so much on uh, uh, capabilities to memorize some knowledge or some information. Uh, because in online education and assessing, uh, if the questions are very direct and uh, re readily answered by seeing the notes and it's, if it's true or false and and the, the student really can go to the PowerPoint or to their notes and, and find the answer, they are more prone to, to fraud. So the teachers really try to give us tasks uh, that uh, demand us to, to have different answers for between the students and also to uh, associate different concepts and propose ideas and projects. And I really think that this is important to continue in the future. Um, other opportunity that I see, I don't know if this is only in Portugal, but I guess no, is that we have a lot of students that are also working due to financial um, constraints, so they need to conciliate the, the studies with work. And if we uh, do decide now that we tried that some parts of online of pharmacy education can be held online and they can be done uh, in any play, in any time during the week and can be manageable, we also make sure that the students need to go less time based for per week to to the faculty and can. Uh, we can have more students that are working, also attending, uh, going to university and increasing the, the, the acceptance of students in university. So uh, if they need to work, they can also uh, continue to study. Uh, but really my, the key message I think is not going back uh, with all the things that we learned when, when the, 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 the pandemic um, uh, is solved because uh, really we need to, to utilize all the different skills and, and new ideas and new uh, tools and strategies that the professors were trying and the ones that do work and are advantages again uh, are fruitful for the students and for the learning process I think we uh, the, the the professors don't shouldn't be uh, going straight back to the comfort zone to the things that they were used to do in the in the past years and really try to continue to use the, these tools thank you mm -hmm. thank you Joel the I mean, what my, my takeaway from what you described is really this period pushed us to um, take pharmacy education and remove some inefficiencies and also optimize it according to the real life experience. So the learnings can be applied further. I guess also IPSF advocating on this would be highly supportive also to expand this uh, outside of Europe to other regions around the world. So those learnings will be highly highly uh, useful for other students and academics and institutions around the world. So thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, by the way, we are receiving interesting questions. We'll be picking up your questions uh, along this session. I'll continue with, with Claire now. And then um, I'll be asking the same question, but Claire, we also received a lot of questions about experiential learning. So. We had, an, we had a webinar about it, so you may find the recording from our uh, Coronavirus Information Hub, so you can get more deep dive information there. But maybe your, your learnings, the innovative, innovative solutions that have been um, acknowledged by University of Nottingham and maybe adding a couple of points about the learnings on the experiential learning would be really interesting for our audience. So okay. we are with you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Nilhan. Yeah, experiential learning has been a difficult one because suddenly we weren't able to send our students out into the hospitals and to the community pharmacy because everybody was too busy, especially when it was our, our semester time, which was at the beginning of the pandemic. So we had to think of innovative solutions. We, we've postponed some because hopefully they will be able to do them next semester. And luckily, our students in our final year had finished all their experiential learning. But we use simulated patients quite a lot in Nottingham. So these are trained actors who act as patients for our students. 
So we did quite a lot of acting as simulated patients with our students in teams, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, my colleague Nalko, who many of you know, she, she planned an amazing um, session for um, many of our students to have one-on-one -on -one experience with us. So we just adapted really. I know that colleagues in other places, um, for example, I think in Colorado, they're using the My Dispense program to help them with some of their experiential learning. But as Nilhan said, I would commend you very much to the um, other webinar that we did on experiential learning because there's a wealth of information on that webinar. Um, do you want me to add a little bit more about what um, we changed in our school, which I want to keep as well. Yes, because, yes please, uh, please, please go ahead, Claire. I agree very much with Zhao about the fact that um, we have moved a long way. Um, I ran a digital course way back in 2000, and I think things haven't changed for 20 years. And then in 10 weeks, they've changed a whole lot. So, of course, we mustn't go backwards. I think we can really go forwards now. One thing in my school, now we're using Teams, I don't have so many emails in my inbox because people are messaging me, it's fantastic. Those sort of things are a massive change. One of the other things that has been a really good change in our school is that on a Tuesday and a Thursday lunchtime, we ha we've been having just half an hour, 45 minutes meeting for the whole staff in the school led by the head of school. And that has been a revelation. Before we had five or six hour long staff meetings once a semester or once a term. Very long, very boring. Now everybody feels on top of everything all the time in real time. And that's something that we all really want to keep. And so that's something which would never have happened, but actually is much, much better. Thanks Claire. I guess again, I see another uh, increased efficiency. <laughs> Uh, from this experience, so let's hope we continue working this way, uh, even through this period and post-pandemic. We are with you now, and we would like to hear your experience. Uh, very curious to hear the changes that should be continued even after this period. What are your thoughts on this? Well, thank you, Nilhan. Actually, uh, the changes uh, experience here that I believe they helped a lot. Uh, there were so even though the the universities were shut down, but there were some special provisions for some special cases. I mean, if there, if there are some crucial experiments going on, so so even though students are not allowed yet, but there are some special provision for the most senior member of the research team to 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 be able to assess those uh, maybe ongoing research. So I think it's an innovation that maybe could help in not totally shutting down the research activity, but in some way maybe making a way to make it, uh, make sure that it is still going on. And another thing that uh, the university implement here is for us, the PhD student, most of the soft skills that are mandatory for our program were converted into online. So we were able to still, I mean, carry on. Uh, assess the courses online and submit our assessment also online. I believe some of the results are already out. So these are some of the innovations that at least were implemented to, I mean, uh, kind of make sure that things are still running. And also there was a special provision by the university for the, especially for the uh, final year PhD students, those that maybe could have some extension like two, three months so that they can be, could be able to finish their uh, program regarding the disruption they had experienced during the, shop, uh, the, the uh, lockdown. So this provision, I believe, is also something, a kind of innovative that will help those that are supposed to graduate maybe within this academic year can have a way to a kind of not have much impact on the maybe delay of their graduation. And then I remember also we instituted a kind of a teleconferencing with our research team. These are all means that will help in maybe making sure that at least the working at home is still going on. I mean, what do you need to do? What is the next line of action? At least even though you are not physically present, but at least some things are still going on. And I believe actually some of the things that one on a personal ground utilize the lockdown period, even though you are not in the lab working physically, but 
you do have some data, you do have some uh, already data at hand. So I use the time to analyze my data, start writing some manuscript. And I think all these are kind of way of maybe utilizing the lockdown period for something better. Thank you, Khalid. Also, uh, leveraging the opportunities that, of course, there are some downsides, many downsides, but there are also upsides, opportunities we can all leverage. And thanks for sharing all of these because it's going to be inspiring to uh, 200 participants we have currently. So thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you for um, sharing your answers. So I have some specific questions to each of you. I'll continue with that. Then we'll be moving on to the Q&A. Keep sharing your questions with us from the Q&A part. Our speakers are uh, responding to you directly or we will pick them up at the end of the, 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 the discussion. So continue sharing your questions with us. Um, so I'll go back to you, Claire. Uh, and you mentioned uh, the, the support systems you have in the faculty. The mm. human interaction is really important, even though it's virtually. Yeah. So could you give some concrete examples of how you supported the faculty members and also the students during this period? What has been some, some best practices that you can share with us? I think I already talked about the staff meetings with the faculty, but a lot of it was about expectations. And what, what our head of school was wonderful. He, he said, look, some of you will be sick. Some of you will be caring for people who are sick. Some of you will be caring for your, your kids at home because they aren't at school. So my expectations are not high. You do what you can. And that was wonderful for people, I think, to feel that they weren't expected to be perfect at this time. And I think that has got the best out of people. And it's been a very interesting approach. And my whole university had that approach, which was very nice. The Greater University of Nottingham, um, they thanked everybody for working so hard in the last three weeks of semester, which was all in the COVID time when we were shut down. And they gave us three days off extra over Easter. So I think we have felt very valued on the whole um, by our university, which is good. And I think for women particularly, it's been hard because whatever we say, it is the women who end up doing the household duties, looking after the children more than the men. And in academia, it's been shown from, um, a few studies have shown already, that women have been submitting less research papers, less research grants than men at this time, markedly less. And because we are judged on that as academics, I think it's really important that we're aware of that and aware of those issues because it's, it's a very unfair system otherwise. Um, so, but my school has been very caring again about that. Um, we've been aware that children are there, even in our Zoom meetings, sometimes the children have been there, so we've seen them. So, um, you know, it, it's difficult. Um, I think in each team, each division within our school, um, people have been doing different things. So in my division, we've been having lunch together every Monday on, on um, Teams, which is very nice. So we can just chat, not a formal meeting at all, just that we can talk about what we've been doing or haven't been doing, or <laughs> the walks we've been going on, the cycles we've been doing and things like that. And that's been really useful because we're used to actually having lunch together every day. So at least we've been doing it once a week. Um, for our students, I think one of the most important things in the UK system, which I know is pretty unique, is that we have a personal tutorial system. So I, as an academic in my school, in each year group, I will have four or five students who I look after from, from the day they start. So, um, in fact, Lena was one of my, my um, students who you probably know. She was one of my tutees originally just just by chance but um so we look after those students we talk to them we meet them regularly we have timetabled meetings with them it is us who give them their exam results us who advise them we talk to them about all sorts of things um we we talk to them about some of their coursework their writing all sorts of things so we get to know them very well so I already knew even my first year tutees because I'd had a lot of meetings with them by the time COVID-19 appeared when we went into lockdown. 
So then we can have more meetings with them on Teams and talk to them and check up on them. And that has been fantastic within our system that we have that. Um, and also for our PhD students, again, we can have regular meetings, chat to them, help them because some of them have felt very isolated as well. And some of them have had to go back around the world because their countries have called them back and people have lost time and lost work. And I know on the, on the um, question and answers, people are asking about lost time for PhD students. Um, and I know it depends on the funder if they can be paid extra money or be given extra time and that will vary. So probably stop there, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Claire. I think this human, human part that it has, we can't expect the, the same thing during this period same performance same attention so it's it's nice that uh, it's adjusted the university has adjusted the expectations and supported the staff and also how you supported students it has been an established system so i guess it allowed us allowed you to to provide support to your students in a systematic way even through this period i think it's really important and i'm sure it has inspired many uh, attendees that we have here so they can perhaps follow a similar approach at their institutions. Uh, speaking about how to support students, so I'm going to move to Joao and from his perspective I will ask um, two questions together but what kind of support do the pharma students would need during pandemic? So what is some perceptions that through your, your individual perception but also uh, what does IPSF say about it? And is there any so examples that IPSF uh, do during this period to support the students? So if you could give your perspective and some examples, it will be really inspiring to the audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Johan. Uh, yeah, this is quite a challenge, a challenging time for the students and they might feel overwhelmed sometimes. Our main uh, concern uh, in IPSF was the mental and was protecting the mental health of our students. Uh, so they do keep in mind that they need to uh, uh, try to, to keep attention to, to their mental health and try to protect it. So for us, it's really important, uh, the faculties, the professors, uh, and even the, the student organizations and IPSF to be, uh, uh, for the faculties to be providing um, um, medical, medic mental health services to, to help and also information so the, the students can be aware of this and also know what are the, the, the lifestyle changes that they can do to, to protect their mental health. Um, for IPSF, what we have been doing, I want to apologize first, this is difficult to compile everything. Uh, we, were, we had quite uh, some hectic months, so um, our first focus was to have posts and public health campaigns on uh, providing information on, on mental health really to, to help the students understand this, be aware that they should be careful, uh, paying attention to protecting their mental health and how they can do it. Um, our message was really protect, protect your mental health. And also we had um, sessions for the student professional development so with sessions like uh, sustaining motivation and also stress management because we, we do think it's quite important to you these times. Um, in general, we were having many webinars trying to provide information for the students either about the, the outbreak, COVID uh, and, and many other topics that might be interesting to them so they can uh, better utilize their time at home. Um, our members, our local members and national members were also very active during this time. As IPSF is working as a federation, we work uh, globally and regional and we also uh, empower our members to uh, have an impact at the national and local level. And we uh, very rapidly initiated a uh, discussion with them so they can share the best practices. So our members were coordinating volunteering programs so the pharmacy students could work in community pharmacies in hospital pharmacies helping in their community and also webinars public health campaigns and and also all, all for for curiosity we have um, an organization a member organization uh, creating ventilators and building them uh, in ipsf uh, this was, was quite interesting and i f i felt that the members were really motivated to uh, have an impact um, in their communities and help with this outbreak and um, we also had like i don't know if you saw the global uh COVID campaign from in in 15 days from ipsf which was quite a madness we had many challenges many uh activities every day for the students to do and a lot of webinars this was quite interesting uh, we, we have been also advocating for blood donation which is something that really decreased at this time and 
um, we were advocating for our students to uh, donate blood and, and uh, the safety of, of the procedure and our online com competitions because ITSF does organize a lot throughout the year. Uh, they were all moved uh, online. So we had the, the, the in-person one scheduled. So for our leaders in training, our health hackathons, our patient counseling events, our clinical uh, skills competition. So uh, we're all moved online. So for example, the clinical um, cases competition, we are doing it with IFMSA, the, this is the organization representing the, the, the medicine students. And, also, we had the industry skills event, more about marketing, and we had more than 800 participants. So if you see like each group uh, for a long time had uh, five participants, you can imagine that we had to, uh, to manage 160 groups uh, being challenged in, the, in this competition. Um, so this, this was uh, different things that we are doing. We are trying to keep our students motivated and, and busy with different tasks and really try to move all our activities from IPSF online. So, uh, we can reduce the impact that uh, uh, the COVID is having in, in IPSF activities. Thank you. Thanks, Joao. I think it's it's great the the scope of events you've been providing to students, the speed you have, and we we were speaking about we are speaking about five hundred thousand students. So you have a nice outreach. So I'm sure it has supported students uh, in a concrete way. So. Thanks for sharing these experiences with us. I think you mentioned the mental health quite a lot of times. So I'm gonna move to Sarira now, and I'm gonna ask about some effective strategies uh, on supporting mental health and well-being of students during the pandemic. So you mentioned a couple of them, but can we deep dive a little bit and hear from you because it's a, it's a great insight you gave to us. So maybe some practical examples and a little bit deep, deep dive into that would be really helpful for our audience. Yeah, um, thank you, Nohan. Um, I think um, the, the students definitely miss the interactions, just like, you know, Claire mentioned that the staff miss the interactions, bumping into each other in the hallway, having a chat, all of that um, allows us to connect in, in ways that I think many of us took for granted. And now everything has to be an email or a text message or a Zoom meeting. Um, and another thing uh, that I feel that th this um, pandemic, um, you know, kind of uh, was associated with is that we all wanted to let our, keep our students up to date. Um, and, you know, if you think about a, a typical student in the, you know, third or fourth year of their pharmacy degree, they're maybe doing four or five um, units or courses in a semester. Um, if every, uh, every, um, coordinators each sends them an email per day to update them and the uni sends them an email and um, the school sends them an email all of a sudden they're getting all this influx of information and I think it made a lot of the students quite anxious and you know and and I think it came down to all right what do I actually need to know to make sure that I'm meeting the requirements of my degree that I'm not delaying myself and I think one thing that our school did quite well is that um, you know at the end of um, you know, early on in the pandemic, we did it um, more frequently, but towards the end, we did it probably at the end of every week. We kind of sent them a brief one pager going, these are all the uh, updates for this week. This is everything you need to know all in one place. And I think that really um, helped them knowing that, you know, every Friday at four o'clock, we're going to get this one pager and know what we um, need to know. So I think something like that is pretty good. I also think Look, and every university uh, and country is different in terms of um, support. But uh, our university has a mental health crisis line. It also has a, and, and that's 24 seven. So in addition to having psychological services that you can just walk into and having a few doctors through the university health service that you can you know, call and book, we also have a um, phone line that you can call 24 seven, even outside of working hours. There's also an SMS chat option. And just thinking of all ways that, you know, young students and who are new to university life like to connect, um, you know, having all these different options, whether you want to come face to face or by the telephone or via chatting or, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, in Australia as a whole, we have something called the Pharmacy Support Service, and they are, um, uh, uh, kind of, they also provide support not just to pharmacists but also to students. You can call them anything about work or uni or anything related to being a pharmacist or a pharmacy student that's causing you 
stressed or you just want to talk about it because sometimes you know we, we might make a little mistake and you know get quite anxious about that we might know that we're about to fail in the game anxious about that or something like that and um, they you're able to call them um you know uh, eight to eleven every every day so you know, most of the day i think finally i also think this has taught um us as academics that we probably need to integrate telehealth into our curriculum um, so I don't know that too many schools around the world had, were teaching students how to communicate and provide healthcare over the phone or over Zoom. I think this has taught us that like this, we might all be sitting on a couch providing, you know, healthcare from the comfort of our home due to, you know, various pandemics or God knows what might happen in the future. So I think all of us need to think long and hard it's something we do overnight but about integrating that somewhere in our curricula make sure that um our students feel equipped for anything that they might face after becoming a pharmacist thanks thank you sarita i think it was really it, it, it probably helped students to flow the information through one channel so less overwhelming and it's good to hear that in your institution, also in the country, the systems have developed really well. It might be also overwhelming to some countries that are facing challenges, so they might not have the infrastructure or the capacity, but uh, at least the approach, the human connection and uh, the offer to support, this can be offered in some other ways as well. So it's really nice to hear this well-developed system and I'm sure it's going to inspire many of the colleagues to pursue the same way. I'm going to move uh, to Khalid now. Now we see that you're back in your lab. So you're back to school. And we have been receiving a lot of questions, especially about conducting the research activities. So now that you're back in the lab, uh, what are the challenges you face uh, about your research activities? Some advice that you can give to our PhD students watching us that will be really helpful, Khalid. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nilhan. Actually, first of all, let me say a big thanks to my supportive professors for their active support, always checking and making sure things are at least going well. And then the key challenge, I think I could, uh, first week of my resumption, I remember experiencing a persistent headache throughout the week. And that could be related to the face mask wearing consistently throughout the week, because obviously, according to the, the new guidelines, you must wear the face mask throughout when you work in the lab. So therefore, I think I do have that personal experience, uh, consistent headache, but it subsided with time. This is one of the challenge. And then also, now the working hours has been well stipulated and you must comply. You must start from social time and close at social time, unlike before the pandemic, that sometimes I can work depending on my lab activity, my experiment, I can stay longer than the usual uh, working hours, but now, no. No matter how, you must close within the time frame stipulated. So it's a challenge, but then one has to adjust accordingly so that at least it's better than not coming to the lab at all. And also, I also remember before the pandemic, we used to have like, a number of undergraduate project students in our laboratory. We used to work together, I mean, sometimes collaboratively, we help each other, organization of the laboratory activities and so on. So all these are not available now because the undergraduate students are not back yet. It's only the PhD students uh, on ground. So now you have to kind of think of how to manage yourself, I mean, the organization, I mean, because you can see barely, there's also this uh, regulation that for each uh, individual, the lab must not contain more than a particular number of the uh, person working in, depending on the size of the laboratory. So all these are kind of uh, things that may make one feel a kind of solitary at the moment, but then it's an adjustment that you must try to make sure that, yes, you adjust accordingly and work according to the prohibition. And also, what I will advise is for the PhD student, whether you are in the first year, second year, or third year, don't procrastinate things. Whenever you have sufficient amount of data, I mean, any data that is meaningful, participate in conferences, participate in, 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 in maybe writing your article. You don't need to wait until you have so much bulk of the information 
I mean, because you never can tell now that maybe the pandemic conferences are canceled and things like that. So it means rare opportunity for presentation of such kind. So don't procrastinate, participate, have data, uh, process it and utilize it on time. Thank you. Thanks, Khalid. Thanks for these powerful messages. It's useful for your research activities, but it's useful for, I guess, everyone. So thanks for these wise words. I know we have a few minutes left, but we have been receiving good questions from the audience. We have been answering some of them by typing, uh, but I'll just wrap up some of them and post some couple of questions. So if I may, we'll just take more 10 more minutes of your time. So thanks to our speakers, also the audience. Uh, we just we, we didn't want to skip these questions. So first of all, um, some messages we received, which I can direct to another means for some answers. So uh, we have been receiving a lot of questions about the online assessment, experiential learning and internships. Uh, you may visit to uh, visit our website www.fip.org slash coronavirus. This is our information hub and we have been conducting webinars on online assessment, experiential learning and the recordings are there. You can get uh, quite deep, deep dive information from there about these topics and all the recordings are publicly accessible. So please visit our website for these topics. And we also received a lot of questions about what are the regional perspectives. Uh, we know there are inequity in education. Some countries have stopped education. So we will be also focusing on new webinars on giving the regional perspectives on these difficulties in between regions. So please stay tuned. And also, for example, uh, Claire has touched upon the gender equity issues during the, the pandemic period. We will be also offering a special webinar on this topic. So again, stay tuned. Also, another question is about what happens to the curriculum post-pandemic. So that's also something that we will be tackling. So stay tuned and uh, continue joining us in our webinars. Now, I'll also go back to some of the questions we receive, especially now that the, the shift to, of education and communications towards virtual. I'd like to just have a round of our speakers what do you think about the effectiveness of it? So we, we, we have spoken about it a little bit, but what do you think of the, because there is always this perception, is the education going to be online forever? So probably the answer is no, but we don't know yet how it's going to be. So let's discuss a little bit and I'll ask your thoughts about the, the, your perceptions on the effectiveness. So I'll start with Sarira. Yeah, thank you. Um, Look, I, I, I think we might, you know, in the next few years, see some data come out in, in, through manuscripts and at conferences, people who are doing research in this space, and, and we might have some good evidence to show whether it's effective or, or, or not based on uh, research. However, uh, anecdotally, and just what I've perceived is that, look, um, I think this has been a difficult and different situation for us all. And Students in general are very grateful that as academics, we've tried our best to not delay them as much as possible. Um, so I, I think for those who um, are engaging with the online material, I think it's, it's effective and hopefully the exams will, will show that the students have grasped the content. I think in terms of lectures and um, any type of presentations that don't require any interaction of students, I think this pandemic makes us think long and hard about whether we need to have these in person at all um, and whether they can be um, pre-recorded or um, uh, through a live video stream um, and, and, and things like that. Now, when it comes to tutorials or teaching students how to vaccinate, teaching students how to compound medicines, uh, we, we have many instances um, where we bring consumers into the classroom for students to role play with them um, especially in the in the mental health space and Claire mentioned that, that they have a lot of simulated patients many of these things I think that once we're uh, we can we would like to continue to do these face to face um, but I think where possible I think universities might start thinking about making things like lectures potentially majority online um, and and given that you know I mentioned previously that I think we do need to have 
telehealth education. There might be some things that will start to be developed for that purpose and continue be, to be delivered via Zoom or you know all these other platforms. But I think we're all craving that human connection. And I think where possible, we're gonna try and get back into the classroom. Thank you, Sarita. Oh, my same question goes to you. What are your thoughts? Very um, briefly. Yeah, uh, I agree that uh, it's still unclear on the, the, the real the impact. But for uh, theoretical classes with all the recordings of the capability from for the students to watch them as many times as they want and to repeat the parts, this might be interesting. Of course, we need to see it um, through the, the results of the assessment and if the assessment are well built and preventing fraud by the answers of and the results of our students, we will be seeing if actually it was uh, successful or not. But I'm mostly concerned about the practical component of uh, the pharmaceutical course because uh, at least in Portugal, and I know that in most countries, the practical component of our course is really important. And uh, what the professors try to do is try to have videos and um, PowerPoints and, and lectures trying to explain the theory, the theory, be, the theory behind the, the practical component. And this is the same as maybe learning how to drive a car by watching videos of people driving cars. It's not the same. Uh, and this part might, might have a long-term impact in, 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 for example, my, my course, because this semester, my, my practical components were not there simply. Um, I know I'm already fourth year, so mo most of the things I was learning, I already um, somehow touched these in other subjects in, in other years. But for example, for a first year a student, I really think that they will be needed to repeat the practical component when it's possible, because this is really uh, important for the beginning of their course. Thank you. Thanks, Ra. Absolutely. Pharmacy is a profession where you we obtain competencies based on our practice. So this is hard to replace it online. Of course, we are discussing ways to close the gaps now, but it requires long-term thinking and, of course, an impact analysis. Uh, I'll ask the same question to Claire, then I'll move to Khalid, and then we'll be wrapping up. Yeah, I, I think I have not much more to add. Um, we were already recording, videoing all our lectures anyway and have been for some years. So um, that that's good practice. But, um, and I think we have, ev oh, no, I know we have evidence that students go back to them again and again and again when they're online. So more valuable in a way than one lecture. But there's all the socialization things about coming to lectures, seeing your friends um, and all those things. Although in pharmacy, because we also have labs and workshops and tutorials, there are other chances for socialization. And I know for next semester, we are planning that if we have a second wave, which God forbid we won't, that everything will be online. But if we don't, our lectures will be online and that will free up more space to have students to come into labs in smaller groups and to do tutorials and everything else with social distancing um, employed. So that's the route we're going down. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I guess now we always have to think future proof starting from the day, day with these learnings. Lit, and your thoughts about the effectiveness of these changes and shifting to online. You're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? <sighs> Yeah, so, yeah, thank you, Nilhan. Actually, I will say from my own perspective, the online teaching actually depends on the subject area. I mean, the, the possibility and the applicability of it. However, for, for instance, for me as a PhD uh, student working with material science and pharmaceutical product development, I will say much of it because I, as I mentioned earlier, more than 98% of my work is lab based. We touch, we experiment. So, Obviously, the online perspective is like going to take like one to two percent of the actual PhD work. So it depends. Even in the pharmacy education, it depends because, as mentioned, some of the challenges for practical aspects, some things that you need to experiment in real, I mean, real physically. So this is also part of the challenge. So some of the subject areas that are aligned with the online uh, procedures that uh, can be implemented easily, fine. But obviously for some aspect, there are still some things that need to be done about. This is my thought. 
Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Well, um, we are nearly towards the end of our webinar, but webcast. But I would like to ask one final question because today was all about inspire writing. I was following the chat and I received the messages from our participants, how inspired and how supported they feel. So I guess this is also a right time to me for me to ask all of you uh, one thing that you would say to the pharmacists around the world in these difficult times. So could you give us one sentence? So I'll go backwards now. So we'll start with you, Kalit, again. So what message you would give to the pharmacists around the world in these times? Thank you, Nilham. My message key is just don't procrastinate. <laughs> something do it. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Thank you. Thanks. There, your message. Mine? Yes. Hello. Um, sorry. Um, thank you to all the pharmacists all over the world. I know you've all been working extra hard, be you academic, practice, community, hospital, industrial. Everybody's been working at full pelt. So thank you for that and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Claire. And Joao? Yeah, uh, I really think that we need to see COVID. And my message is like COVID is the opportunity and not talking about pharmacy education. I really think that uh, the, the, the role of the pharmacists and the impact on the, the community really uh, increased during this time because uh, uh, they were needing our, our, our contribution and we need to continue to use the, uh, to have COVID as the opportunity to expand our, our role. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And Sarira, let's wrap up with your message. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll just um, conclude by saying, look, I think change is never easy. And I think mm -hmm. this change was imposed on all of us. Yes. Um, and um, I, think, I, I think as long as we keep our patients' best interests at heart, and as long as we um, continue to support each other and, you know, don't underestimate the power of asking a colleague or a student or a peer, you know, do you want to come on Zoom for five minutes for a quick coffee or a quick sandwich together? Um, let's not underestimate the power of, you know, human connection, even if it is virtual. And uh, I think if we try to keep those things at our um, core, I think we'll all come out of this stronger as individuals and as a profession. Thank you. Thanks, Sarira. Thanks to all of you. So with these powerful messages, uh, we'll wrap up today's episode. I would like to sincerely thank to our speakers, our participants joining us from all around the world. It was a day of inspiration to me. I guess it has been to many. So thanks to all of you for your inspiring experiences sharing with us and also your comments, your questions. It will help us to continue tackling the challenges you have been facing. So stay tuned with us. And um, before I wrap up, uh, we will be also providing a four question survey that we will pop up and we need your support to hear your feedback so we can improve our digital event offerings. And I guess the final message is again, thank you very much for joining us. Stay self, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. <laughs> Bye.